Yeah, so I was asked to here to talk about Rex computing. Um, as Andy was saying, we've developed a, a new process architecture, so uh, a whole new instruction sets, core design, uh, full chip implementing those cores, and uh, uh, with a team of four people, which uh, you can see here. So myself, uh, Paul in the Georgia Tech shirt, uh, sorry for being here at Stanford. Uh, at least it's not like MIT, I am. But, um, and then Nariman, who's also in the audience, and Piyush. And uh, without all of them, obviously, I would not be here today. Um, a little over three years ago, this just started off as a crazy idea. And uh, coupled with you know being a bit young and the naivety of both uh, Paul and I, we actually thought we can make a processor uh, for you know basically no money and uh, uh, you know the two of us. Had to double the team size, but uh, I think we've done uh, pretty well so far. So um, when we started Rex, we uh, were trying to think about, um, uh, you know, what are the basic precepts of, com of uh, computer architecture that haven't really been rethought over the past 30 or 40 years. And uh, as we're digging deeper into, you know, what are the really bare minimum things necessary to do computation, um, we started thinking that it's not as much of the computation itself that is the issue, but how we actually get data to uh, the processor and uh, really the whole memory system. And while there has been a lot of talk about the memory system at a, uh, uh, you know, more focus on the memory itself, so trying to find alternatives to DRAM, et cetera, um, there hasn't been much thought in terms of, uh, you know, how it's actually architected on the chip itself. Your slide says confidential. I will have to leave the room if that's true. <laughs> Excuse me, I've taken a bunch of these slides from other decks, and uh, all of this is not confidential. <laughs> Three six inches. <laughs> 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 um, so still have 2016 on it. Yeah, uh, can tell how uh, we've been busy actually working on the chip instead of the the slide decks. That's a good thing. <laughs> it means you didn't finish the whole thing this afternoon. <laughs> um, yeah. So. Uh, Basically, what we were looking at in terms of the memory system was the on-chip cache hierarchy. And over the decades, this has grown from having an off-chip uh, SRAM-backed cache, uh, very small, still relatively uh, high latency compared to the actual chip uh, speed, but uh, you know, still faster, closer access than uh, uh, DRAM. And you know, since uh, uh, the um, you know, 286, we've gone to having uh, on-chip caches, L1, L2, L3, et cetera, um, without much thought of the, the implications that that has as we start to approach the, you know, twilight phase of Moore's Law. Um, and so while, uh, you know, 30 years ago, if you were looking at this diagram then compared to now, which this is for uh, Intel Sandy Bridge architecture, um, while doing the actual floating, double precision floating point operation only takes about 100 picojoules, actually moving the 64 bits necessary all the way from DRAM to your register file takes about 40x more energy than that. And uh, uh, that's kind of a problem. And while there's been, you know, all of the, the free benefits of Moore's Law has been really helping that what is now 100 picojoules hasn't really helped much on the other side. Um, so when most people think, uh, look at this slide and say, uh, uh, oh, well, that makes sense. The DRAM is, you know, separate on the motherboard. You have to, you know, that is having to be refreshed. It's using a good amount of power itself. You know, that, that's fine. But in reality, about 60% of that 4,200 picojoules is being used on the processor itself. So, you know, the, the DRAM and everything, even if that uh, gets closer to your processor, like we're trying to do 3D integration within packages, and even if we're trying all these new fancy, uh, um, you know, memory technologies outside the chip, um, that's only improving 40% of that number. Uh, and the main thing that's just happened over these decades is this uh, uh, more and more, uh, adding more and more complexity to the on-chip cache hierarchy in order to try to help programmers is the, the main, main point. Um, you know, programmers don't want to manage memory, like the initial purpose of caches, just so the programmer can, you know, just deal with the virtual address space, don't have to, you know, segment that themselves, really just make their lives easier. And uh, this idea is, is great in theory, but uh, um, the cost that we're starting to pay, especially as uh, we're not getting the you know free improvements that we have in the past, um, is really starting to bite us. So uh, we started Rex with this uh, realization and uh, um, said that 
you know, we need to architect a new uh, architecture, you know, with this fact in mind. So uh, we've developed the Neo processor architecture. Um, so it's a 200, so it's a many core MIMD uh, core um, VLIW. I'll get to that back to that in a second. Hopefully people don't get too scared about the VLIW word um, with the fancy two dimensional uh, um, network on chip and uh, a very, the, the big differentiator what I just spent the past couple minutes talking about is uh, really the uh, on-chip cache hierarchy differences. So we've moved to a purely software managed memory system where we have just plain physically addressed um, local memories for each one of our, our cores um, and then do all of the fancy uh, things that are handled by today's hardware managed memory systems uh, instead in software. And the, the real goal of this, you know, set off that, uh, you know, unless we can really get an order of magnitude energy efficiency improvements, uh, there's no real point in, in doing what we're trying to do. Um, you know, we're up against enough competition, you know, four guys versus uh, uh, Intel. And, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, we have to have a, a, you know, real sort of advantage for that. Um, so as I said before, you know, we've designed a lot of uh, aspects of this. Uh, so everything from the instruction set to the full chip. But uh, we realize that, you know, we can't just, even though I'm in love with the hardware aspects, uh, you actually need to have software run on this thing and you know have this available to folks in a way that they can actually use and so uh you know not just defining the instruction set core chip but also the actual reference node designs and the software tools to be able to use this uh, so as andy said a bit earlier about uh, uh the original s1 team and developing all of the tools necessary for that computer um uh, you know, we've taken a, a fairly similar approach. I guess we've been able to leverage the past 30 years of advancement and knowledge in that sense, plus uh, the advent of, uh, you know, the real development of the open source software community. But, uh, you know, starting to do all this for, for ourselves uh, is quite a big leap. So, uh, kind of give you a little bit of idea of the instruction set. I guess this slide is maybe a bit out of order from what I originally wanted, but uh, you know, it's a very risk inspired architecture. I did say the VLIW word uh, a bit earlier, which a few shocked expressions on people's faces. Um, but uh, uh, our real point here is to uh, keep a very simple, very clean design and, you know, try to exploit as much instruction level parallelism, task level parallelism, and, uh, you know, actual data parallelism as possible. Um, everything's load store based. So our memory actually moving data around on chip through multiple chips and using off chip memories uh, is a, a, a very simple clean design, and uh, we've really focused on floating point uh, performance. Um, so everyone's scared about uh, VLIW, and this is the thing I get all the time with the number one thing being Itanium. Um, so wasn't it proven that, you know, I, uh, uh, VLIW just doesn't work with Itanium? And I bring up this uh, picture of, uh, uh, you know, block diagram of the Itanium architecture, and a uh, big problem the, the original concept of, of VLIW, which, you know, was really pioneered by floating point systems and, you know, the actual VLIW name with uh, um, Multiflow and um, others in the mid-late 80s, uh, was this concept that you can remove a lot of complexity out of the chip design itself um, in order to, and, you know, have a software be able to take some of that burden off. And most of that back then was related to the instruction decoder. So instead of having these really complex CISC uh, arc, uh, instructions um, that, you know, you had a big fancy decoder that handled all the scheduling, making sure that, you know, you're not um, uh, having any instructions conflict, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it was the compiler's job to actually do all of that for, for the hardware. And so when I look at Itanium with branch prediction, these caches, which are indeterminate, uh, indeterminate pipelines, depending on what instructions you're running, um, in what order, et cetera, et cetera, where you just cannot actually know how the processor will perform at runtime um, what, when you're compiling an application, how is the compiler actually able to do this uh, and actually make any of these sort of optimizations? So uh, the big part, which I'll get to in a bit with uh, Rex is, oops, um, is uh, this fact that we are really focused on hard real-time determinism for everything. And then the second thing I always get is for scratch pads. So this concept, this concept of a software managed memory system where uh, we have, you know, just physical addressing, uh, you know, 
none of the, the fancy caching, et cetera, for uh, uh, the actual end user um, always brings up comparisons to cell. So if you're familiar with the cell processor made as a collaboration between uh, Toshiba, Sony, and IBM, uh, primarily you know, used in the uh, um, uh, PlayStation 3, uh, it was notoriously difficult to program with because the, the real idea by Sony and Toshiba at that point was uh, to use what the, were the cell special processing units, the SPUs, or SPEs, and the, uh, and the whole design point of this was they were, you know, relatively powerful but still small. They had eight of these in, you know, a 2005 processor, um, but... IBM's part of the agreement was that they were going to be fabricating the chip, but also uh, they want to actually have you know more skin in the game and put in that uh, uh, power processing unit, so power PC architecture. And uh, the big problem with this was that created a huge bottleneck where in the SP with the SPUs the. Uh, um, actual only way that you could get to external memory was actually having to go through the power processing unit. So there was this huge overhead, and that system had its own cache, et cetera, that just made it impossible for um, you know, a compiler to actually know how to, to access large parts of memory, and just real pain in the ass. So um, when we're going into the Neo architecture a bit, uh, I like using this as and give an idea of the instruction set. Uh, so here we have up in the upper left-hand corner, the floating point unit and its uh, instructions. So we've got um, uh, you know, 22 instructions total for the floating point unit that uh, uh, supports full IEEE 64-bit. Um, in the future, doing packed uh, single precision, potentially half, and other formats. Um, and uh, the real you know, philosophy behind VLIW is being able to exploit task level or instruction level parallelism. So we want to be able to use the FPU, the load store unit, the outbox or secondary load store unit, and the ALU all at once. So one of the really unique things that we did with our instruction set architecture was this fact that we can, uh, if you look at this full 64-bit word, we're fitting four different instructions from four different units in it. And depending on the actual uh, register usage of uh, the different instructions, the length of the, the way that the entire 64 bits is allocated tells you exactly what instructions you can use. So our instruction decode logic is ridiculously simple because we're able to pass the same 64-bit uh, um, instruction across all of our uh, um, to through all of our stages for all of our um, instruction units, and each uh, execution unit is able to uh, figure out exactly what it has to do for that. And uh, unlike a lot of architectures, both due to having a lot of register uh, ports, but uh, also the format of the instructions themselves, is that we can actually do things like an FMA to 128-bit load store operations and any of your basic ALU instructions all simultaneously. So in a lot of cases where it's just impossible, most architecture and you know, um, even VLIW architectures of the past, uh, where you just cannot really get theoretical peak uh, performance because you can just, it's impossible to use all of the execution units, um, in a vast majority of the applications that we're targeting, that is actually possible. So quick question, are you yeah. Since you just mentioned your compiler in the slide before, I don't know which language you're doing. Are you going to be comparing your compiler to the Bulldog compiler? Um, you mean in terms of uh, the actual scheduling capabilities or well, just a in kind of? Uh, so I won't be in this presentation. So a lot of, yeah. Um, you, we could talk a bit more later. Um, a lot of our soft, so I guess since we're leveraging uh, so much of the software capabilities to actually make people be able, be able to use our processor, um, the software really is the secret sauce when it comes to most of this. Very simplified hardware with software taking a role. So uh, we're happy to start showing hardware now. Uh, still uh, going to be a little bit until we show the internals of some of the software. Um, but yeah, the, the main point of this is we can actually utilize all of our functional units um, simultaneously um, and be able to get, you know, at a single core level, uh, to start off with, uh, close to, to theoretical peak performance. So uh, here's a diagram of our core. Uh, we have a 64-bit ALU, a 64-bit floating point unit, and uh, uh, two load store units, which are both capable of either half-word 32-bit 
Word 64-bit or double Word 128-bit operations every single cycle. Um, all of them are fully pipelined, with the only instructions not pipelined is the integer divide. Um, not fully pipelined is the floating point divide and floating point square root. But uh, um, other than that, you can issue a new instruction every single cycle for each one of these units. Uh, so we can really exploit, uh, uh, you know, get very high IPC count over this. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the big point of this is that we can, within a core, if your program fits inside of our scratch pad with this current test silicon, uh, 64 kilobytes of scratch pad, in the future 128, 20, 256-bit uh, kilobyte or more, um, you know, you're going to hit theoretical peak performance. Like we can guarantee if you're able to do a fuse multiply add every single cycle um, as part of the inner loop of your program, you will be hitting two gigaflops um, with our one gigahertz uh, nominal clock, uh, clock speed. Um, and uh, it's also really small, so not including the scratch pad. So just looking at the Neo core and actually the router as well, it's less than 0.1 square millimeters in TSMC's 28 nanometer process. Uh, so a ridiculously small core size. And I'll have a comparison a bit later on showing how that ranks up against uh, uh, some other both mobile and high performance cores. Um, and what's kind of shown here with the scratch pad is that uh, it is uh, multi-bank. So we have eight 64-bit uh, single-ported registers. So if you're doing a double word read or write to that, you're actually utilizing two of the banks. And uh, we have a really cool hashing system and such that uh, makes that really powerful in terms of being able to with every single cycle, be able to use all eight of those banks for both incoming data into the core on the network on chip, which I'll get to on the next slide, sending data out on the network on chip, and doing processing just within the core. So uh, when we go out to the network on chip, so uh, just designing a chip, a, you know, very uh, simple processor core, uh, and thinking you're just going to have one of those on chip won't really work today, so we're trying to embrace task level parallelism. So we have a, a true MIMD model, so each one of our cores is fully independent and all connected to this uh, two-dimensional mesh network on chip. Uh, it behaves, it, it follows a uh, static priority routing system, so uh, we, it's fully deadlock free. You're able to send messages every single cycle with one cycle per hop um, for each core that you go down on the, the knock. Um, the fully deterministic part is a really important part uh, when it comes to our compiler and actually trying to schedule these things as, you know, just doing something within one core is interesting, but actually being able to architect uh, programs to be pipelined over multiple cores or, uh, uh, you know, have completely separate applications that you don't actually want potentially to have uh, interactions with other per, uh, applications on the chip be able to uh, run and coexist in, in you know on a single chip um, and so that full uh, fully deterministic behavior uh, enables us at the compiler level to actually give hard guarantees on you know it's going to take exactly five cycles to go from core zero to uh, core 13, for instance. And uh, with that knowledge, we uh, uh, actually can write very performant and have the compiler generate very performant code. And uh, when it gets comes to the address space, uh, another cool aspect of architecture is, um, if you look at core zero, um, that is the first, in the case of our test chip, uh, 64 kilobytes of uh, address space. So address zero through 64K, uh, corresponds to core zero. And if core zero were to read or write from any one of those addresses, it would be accessing its own scratch pad in one cycle. Now, if it goes one address higher, it would now actually be able to write to core one's scratch pad. And that just takes, and that's handled completely automatically for it. And uh, if it accesses that address, it takes one additional cycle to write out to that. Um, and then that is just one additional hop to any core within the chip. This also expands not just to the address space on a single chip, but we can expand the address space to multiple chips, uh, which will be in the next slide. So with uh, this test chip, we uh, uh, have 16 of our uh, cores and then two CERTES. So CERTES on the, the north that uh, basically routes up to anything below the, the uh, current chip's address and uh, chip uh, 
south, which does the opposite. Um, it's extremely high bandwidth compared to most CERDES, um, which is very good for us when I'm, you know, we're, we're considering trying to move a lot of data going through our chip in kind of a systolic array fashion. Um, and uh, so 125 gigabits per second in each direction per CERDES. Um, and uh, we've been able to utilize a, a multi-chip module um, to actually show this off with our current uh, test silicon. Um, and again, that the protocol is actually reutilized for uh, the chip-to-chip -chip links. So over the CERDES, you'd be using the exact same address space if you have multiple of our chips connected or say are connected to something that is has access to a you know, large amount of memory like DRAM. Um, with our current test board, we have uh, the ability to connect to an FPGA which has DRAM attached and we basically just map that DRAM um, to be a either something higher or lower in the uh, global address space. Um, so to go a bit about the, the um, CERTES, since it is pretty uh, interesting. Um, so it's not your tra traditional CERTES, which is just a, a differential pair uh, connected to another CERTES following you know, the same uh, standard. Um, but we're actually doing a unique thing using a, uh, another startup company called uh, Candu Bus in Switzerland. Uh, they've developed a, a new type of CERTES that is much closer to a, a source synchronous uh, forwarded uh, link. But uh, so they're able to do this 125 uh, gigabit per second, which is you know over twice as fast as the ble bleeding edge new CERTES on uh, uh, you know 16 nanometer, and we're doing it on 28. But uh, by utilizing multi-level signaling, we can uh, actually do much lower power and not have to have ridiculously high uh, uh, frequencies. Um, and then the addition of actually doing forwarded clock. Um, instead of you know having embedded clock for each differential uh, pair that we're sending over, um, we uh, uh, also reduces the power significantly. Um, so to give you a bit of idea of how that's connected, on the left here, basically every the um, sixteen wires that are you know abbreviated there, but uh, is the the going between two of our chips, say within a multi-chip module, or one of our chips and the the FPGA. That's a uh, able to be connected to it, um, we're able to get up to 25 uh, gigabits per second. This is simplified a bit with a different uh, reference clock, but uh, with this we can get down to 1.4 picojoules per bit for transfers. And uh, if you know anything about today's CERTES, the state-of-the-art ones used for like HMC and PCIe Gen 4 um, on you know modern uh, 28 nanometer chips is around 20 to 25 picojoules per bit. Uh, so we get a really fast interface and uh, are not using much power. So uh, I guess to give a bit of idea on the timeline of how we uh, got this in here. Um, so we closed our original seed financing of $2 million, as uh, Andy brought up earlier, um, back in July of uh, uh, 2015. Uh, we spent a, a couple months setting up the company, um, interviewing folks, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, negotiating with uh, um, IP vendors for uh, standard cell libraries, fabrication, et cetera, um, and eventually made our two hires in November of 2015, um, all the way through RTL development till eventually taping out in uh, July of, uh, July 20th of uh, uh, 20, uh, 2016. So anniversary of the moon landing, it was a good day. <laughs> um, and we finally got our chips back on October 3rd of uh, uh, 2016. And it's been hell with the uh, board de development between now and then, then and now. Um, so to give you a bit of idea on kind of the flow that we followed to be able to do this in a very aggressive timeline. So we developed, you know, a full custom core design and, you know, multi-chip module, uh, yeah, multi-core chip and multi-chip module with the uh, uh, with that design in only six months, and so uh, we used a full Cadence uh, tool suite. Cadence has been a great partner. Um, bit of an ad for them here, um, but uh, we utilize their newest and greatest and uh, best. Uh, uh, tools for synthesis, place and route, verification, et cetera, along with a really great tool called Joules that I like to highlight for allowing us to actually do uh, early power analysis and was really, really uh, influential in terms of us being able to make good design decisions to optimize for power, which uh, is really the name of the game for us. Um, 
we are running on about a, a weekly uh, flow uh, going from a new core um, RTL uh, complete to being able to have full place and routed uh, netlist that we were able to do uh, power performance and area analysis on. And uh, um, eventually from having final chip RTL to having a what was supposed to be our final uh, tape out netlist uh, was, uh, or excuse me, final tape out GDS that later had to uh, the ECO'd uh, was only a month. So very simple design enabled us to uh, uh, really do things really, really quickly. Um, so kind of to give you a look at what we actually produced. Uh, so the 16 core demo, uh, you could see the two 30s, the north side and the south side, along with our 16 cores. Uh, the big, you know, blocks that you see in the middle there are the scratch pads. So each core has uh, eight scratch pad banks. As part of before, we utilized uh, the ARM standard cell uh, and ARM memory compilers for those. Um, and uh, actually, for this, uh, and where I'll show in a little bit with uh, um, our we, we were originally targeting about 32 double precision gigaflops per watt um, and about 8x better than Intel um, on a newer process node than what we taped out up. Um, and again, built by a team of four and we're expecting to have a newer version next year. This bot picture on the bottom here is the multi-chip module. So we've got two of our 16 core chips with the uh, 125 gigabit in each direction uh, link. And then the links on the external sides are also broken out, which enables us to connect multiple of our packages on the board, which I'll be showing in a little bit. And uh, um, yeah. So the evaluation kits, uh, here's a picture of the board that uh, we'll all be demoing in a bit, as well as uh, we're able to connect this to an FPGA. So on the flip side of that board, we have uh, FMC adapters, which allow us to plug into a variety of FPGAs, as seen here. And uh, uh, enable us to actually really stress the uh, uh, memory bandwidth of, uh, of our chip. Um, and those will be on sale shortly. A bit on uh, the compiler and that fun stuff. Uh, we've been leveraging the LLVM uh, uh, open source project. So uh, we created a custom backend um, and really have been working most on the optimize, uh, optimization uh, levels. So uh, most of our focus has been you know, trying to have the compiler be aware of the latencies we have to different locations in memory. Um, and, uh, um, you know, it's mostly scheduling issues uh, that to be able to get most of the, the performance. Right now, we, uh, there was, you know, some tweaks we had to do on the front end to be able to get uh, C and C++ support with Clang. We have very rudimentary support right now. Um, and most of our testing is being done with assembly that we uh, have written, you know, through the uh, RTL and now now having real silicon development process. And I'll also be giving a demo in a shortly for our uh, software simulation tools. It's called uh, NeoSim or um, NeoSim ICAS, uh, the Interactive Cycle Accurate Simulator. Um, with this, we get, uh, so we actually were able to generate that using our um, own RTL. So the exact same RTL that we taped out with, we were able to make a C, uh, uh, compile to C++ to have a cycle accurate simulator that is pretty darn fast. On our uh, Intel i7 6700K processor, desktop CPU, you know, 350 bucks or so, um, we're able to actually get about one megahertz uh, simulated speed uh, for our, our single tile simulation, um, which is really fast compared to RTL simulation. When we were doing most of our work initially with uh, um, you know, a variety of different uh, RTL-based simulators, we were lucky to be getting maybe, uh, <laughs> what, 25 to, to 50 kilohertz. Um, but you know, we get the exact same level of uh, uh, simulation detail. And unlike pretty much any other simulator that you can get from commercial uh, uh, semiconductor vendors, you can see every single register within our chip. And some of the cool features, which sadly aren't working today, I was hoping to show, but uh, we have cool things like a schematic level viewer to be able to see inside the actual pipeline cycle by cycle um, being for each of the functional units. Um, and uh, also be able to see things on network on chip uh, have, you know, sort of heat maps based on program runtime. Um, library support. 
Uh, so this is very much work in progress portion, but uh, is extremely important for our overall future. Uh, so we want to be able to support as many of the existing programming models um, as possible, but obviously we have some preference to uh, a couple of our fa favorites. Um, but in terms of real application areas that we're looking at are mostly things where you would be running you know, bare metal code on this. So we really love DSP-like applications, anything. Uh, and our first demo that I was going to show here today was for uh, FFT, for mobile base station processing. I already talked a bit about the debugging profiling, but a uh, cool thing that LVM, um, with some of our changes, Spinny will give us is some really cool graphs in terms of being able to show, similar to the Bulldog compiler originally, uh, Josh Fisher's original Bulldog uh, paper was, you know, is still pretty awesome to me because, you know, you get to see these graphs programs, which most people just don't seem to really conceptualize well. Um, and real-time signal processing, kind of I was just mentioning some of the DSP stuff and where we see uh, really our best um, levels of performance and efficiency gain is in the uh, DSP mobile base station space where with the oncoming uh, uh, kind of 5G uh, um, evolution of technology coming, uh, there's been a real push by the telecom vendors to utilize FPGAs and more exotic hardware than they have in the past, which uh, actually is hurting them uh, a bit when it comes to power efficiency and, and cost. So we see ourselves as having a very good solution for that. So I've got a live demo um, that was working four hours ago and then broke uh, three hours ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't work with animals or do live demos. Um, so I guess, can the camera be tilted at all onto the table? Yeah, right here. I uh, can't see too well, but um, this is our development board. Saw so on that picture, uh, not that one, th this one over here, I guess. Yeah, here. <laughs> cool. All right, yeah, it's showing up on the screens behind you. That, that helps. Oh, well, um, there's not too much on it. I guess there's like the Cylon Knight Rider Eye, which you know I'm a fan of, but. Uh, so we've got a development board, have the, the you know, Knight Rider kit sort of thing going on there. Um, and we have slots for two of our packages. So we can have up to four of our 16 core dies, um, you know, a total of 64 cores on a single uh, board. Uh, right now, we only have a single uh, package in there. Um, I don't want to open that up yet, but uh, um, I guess I could show you. Here, here are the, the chips that would go in there. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, the live demo I was going to give was a 1024-point FFT, uh, uh, FFT, so good... Uh, uh, we're using it as a benchmark to doing a 10 megahertz, 600 sub-channel um, uh, FFT base, ba baseband for uh, uh, LTE. Um, and I do have some numbers, but I'm just going to see if this works. So if we can switch the computer screen. So um, don't think it's, there we go. Cool. So here is a, uh, all the commands that we have on the board. So we've got a PIC microcontroller here connected through UART to uh, my PC um, that actually is connected to our debug inter SPI interface on our chip. Um, we've got a bunch of fun uh, commands on here, but uh, sadly it seems that I broke the chip earlier. <laughs> so I'll try doing, this just initializes the ADC and gives us our initial values for um, um, actually being able to do power measurements and everything. I can do power and right now domain A which is our chip is using uh, 11 milliwatts uh, which is a bit too low it should be around 50 just idling right now um, I think that in doing a stress test earlier of this I left the FFT running for uh, about hour and a half and after I rebooted it it was dead or was now exhibiting this issue um, so I can just turn on the PLL. I'll set it just to do 500 megahertz. Right now I have uh, 750 and one gigahertz supported as well. And uh, I'll do a um, FFT and do it for chip zero. So it's executing or it's sending the code over. It takes about a minute or so. 
but uh, oops. Or it may have died. Actually, so we're doing uh, uh, full 1024 points. So we're using two banks. At eight, so it's total 16 kilobytes of data um, onto all 16 cores. Um, so this is going over SPI. Due to a board issue, we actually um, are not able to use the hardware SPIs on the microcontroller. So uh, we're doing bit banging. So it's a bit slower than you would normally um, expect. Huh. OK, giving me back to the terminal. So it may have ran. Let's do power to see what the power is. 32 milliwatts. Yeah, it, it does not seem to be working. <laughs> um, but anyways, we do have cool commands like uh, read CSR. So I can do uh, help app. I always forget the. So read CSR, we want to do it to tile 0, 0 on chip 0. Um, or CS, I want to do CSR 11, which is the pro program counter. And uh, I'll do that for chip 1. Well, the program counter has a value. So something actually did ran, run there. And that does, I don't think that does, is actually a valid program counter value. So something is definitely uh, messed up there. But um, yeah. Uh, Good thing I did take pictures before, <laughs> before it broke. So uh, we, we, we just got these chips actually running about two weeks ago. And um, the yeah, we, we just got them running about two weeks ago. We were running some really basic tests. A couple of the chips that we put on like just didn't work, and we didn't know why. <laughs> so uh, we eventually got one that worked, which this one's been going you know, pretty good for about a week. And, but anytime I've got any results, I always take pictures. So happy I did this time. Um, so this was before, like this was doing the initial power before I even turned on the PLO or anything. And it's about uh, 59, 60 milliwatts uh, for that uh, domain A, which is uh, our core power domain. And then that domain B is the IO power. Um, it says P0 at the end there, that's just a bug in the code that I didn't bother to fix. Um, but you can actually do the calculation 1.8 uh, volts times the, the current, um, which I did a bit later on, so don't have to pull out your calculators. Um, PLL3, uh, set that to 1 gigahertz, that all programmed fine, uh, and the chip got up to about a low under uh, um, 100 milliwatts. And then eventually here, um, yeah. Doesn't want. Let me zoom in too well there. Uh, we were doing load F FT, so we did see on the on the uh, screen before that it was executing the SPI commands. Uh, it didn't seem to actually get into loading the FFTs. Uh, there is like a handshake there that that happens um, sometimes. Since this is broken for the past three hours, um, it has actually like done the handshake, but then it seems to like break later on. So. Still have to do some debugging with that, and eventually actually starts doing the reset, which sets the PC counter back to the program counter back to zero, and then it starts the execution. And in the end, uh, it got the test running, and I did power check, and it was up to about 223 milliwatts. After leaving that on and just keeping it on for uh, about 45 minutes or so, when I checked again, um, it was up to about 250 milliwatts, and that stayed about constant. So uh, in terms of what should have happened when we did a live demo, but I'll summarize for how it was a bit earlier, uh, we were doing about 1.06 gigaflops per core while running at 1 gigahertz, uh, so 16.96 for the whole chip. Um, the power usage for the actual core power, all of our, our cores and the PLL, was uh, about 250 milliwatts. Uh, power, power usage for the I.O. was about 178. And, uh, while that was not running on the current chip, but if we were, were fully saturating the uh, uh, 125 gigabits of the SERTI, that would have added about 250 milliwatts. Uh, so in total, adding all of those up, even the part that we didn't test uh, today, uh, would be give us about 25 gigaflops per watt, uh, double precision, so full F IEEE 754-2008-64-bit. Um, many of the numbers you may see, uh, you know, 
that don't actually say that exactly, uh, usually refer to single precision or something that isn't IEEE uh, compatible. Um, so that's about, and this is you know, not fully optimized assembly code right now, and uh, we're still about 2x better than Intel on 14 nanometer today. And that's Intel's advertised numbers, which you're not going to see in reality. So uh, to give you, and that was also for an FFT, which has question. Computational efficiency. Yeah. How is it your architecture compared to like Intel in terms of the overhead of like a context switch? Right. Yeah. So um, I guess the, that's a longer question to answer. So the uh, when it comes to like relocating code, for instance. So one of the cool things about our global address space is that at a you know. If we have a set of code that is just running on a single chip, or sorry, excuse me, a single core, we can actually move that to any other core without incurring any penalties. There's no nothing in actual the instructions that need to be changed to be moved to different cores. Thing that does like, since um, I guess I didn't specify explicitly, but um, our network on chip is write only. So for instance, when we're um, any time that uh, one core needs data from another core. The, the core that actually has that data needs to send it. So it's the job of compiler or, you know, if uh, um, we have an interrupt network, which I didn't show explicitly, but, uh, um, you know, it's the job of core to issue an interrupt to another core to say, hey, I need this data or, you know, do some other sort of handshake. We don't, like, the whole sort of threading model that we have for this isn't one that uh, particularly, like, goes to something where you want to have a core you know, do do a, a switch like that. But the the real point is we want to have data in the scratch pad for, you know, its execution, you know, when when it's actually needed. So um, the uh, we, we do have things like we, we don't have branch prediction, but we do have branch instructions with delay slots, et cetera. So like in this FFT, we were, um, you know, a lot of people don't like branch delay slots, but we were able to exploit that to, you know, get a bit, uh, tighter in inner, inner loop and and such so much a uh, longer answer but uh, so to give you a bit of bit of an idea of comparison for what will be our production chip 256 core on 16 nanometer based on uh, what we have right now um, so uh, uh, you know for each core in terms of uh, double precision floating point we're able to Theoretical peak of two gigaflops per core, uh, you know, you can multiply it by 256. Uh, the numbers from Intel and gang are pretty much, you know, advertised as you are never going to exceed this rather than what you see in, in real life. And um, one of my, I can do a whole presentation rant on a, um, sort of a, a how things are benchmarked and advertised, um, but uh, most of the numbers that you see from the big guys, they want to be showing their level three blahs, their you know dense matrix matrix sort of workloads. Uh, since you know pretty much anything can do pretty well with that without ex have, needing to have much of in terms of memory bandwidth, and so big architectural decision on our side, both at a single chip, if you're just able to load up the the and uh, you know do everything on within the memory of your single processor, um, you know we are going to hit theoretical peak performance that we have the bandwidth and the ability to use all the functional units to do that for level one, two, and three blahs. Um, so, you know, the FFT I showed, um, not super optimized, but, you know, doing 50, 53% um, of theoretical peak is, I think, a pretty good start, and we should be getting much closer to that. Once we actually get real Linpack compiled and running on this, um, it, it will be blazing. Um, so we see ourselves being about 10 years ahead of the gang when it uh, uh, comes to energy efficiency at this level. Um, you know, this year uh, Intel's next generation uh, processors are staying on 14 nanometer for the first time. Um, I, like Moore's law effectively is, is over in terms of just simple CMOS scaling and in terms of since Denard's law breakdown, et cetera, we just haven't been seeing the same uh, improvements over the past decade and it's going to plateau um, to a greater extent and I think really realized by everyone um, over the next decade. 
But we see ourselves scaling very well. Um, we really like what TSMC has to offer in the next uh, uh, fabrication generations. And we also see them, there being a ton of architectural improvements to be made. Um, with this test chip, we were very uh, conservative in terms of decisions we made, like our idle power with just the PLL running. Technically, the whole chip is like, program counter is just set to zero, but all the functional units don't have any you know, fancy clock or power gating or anything. So if we were to really try to leverage doing low power design techniques, um, you know, our chip, like just their current chip at 28 nanometer can be competitive with the next couple of generations of, uh, of Intel. And uh, on a cost semiconductor economics perspective, we're a big fan of uh, um, keeping to small uh, dies. So while the big uh, you know, Intel Xeon Phi chip and uh, any of NVIDIA's GPUs are pushing 600, 700 square millimeters, um, the yield and such for that is very, very low and leads to high costs and uh, um, you know, suboptimal kind of designs. You have to account for being able to have a bunch of redundancy in, in your design, which makes, you know, you have to make sacrifices. Uh, we see that like 100 square millimeters as being a real sweet spot in terms of how uh, you, you can fabricate things and uh, be able to get away with, uh, um, you know, having very good yield and, uh, you know, make very well optimized designs. It's a good guesstimate. Um, I see. <laughs> yeah, I, I would, so in terms of like NVIDIA's yields, like we're sharing, you know, a fab with, with TSMC. Once you're pushing, you know, 500 plus square, square millimeter die sizes, your, your yields start dropping. Um, Uh, yeah, so we so we got 200 dies back for for this test chip, um, and doing a multi-project wafer like this is not a good way to like uh, calculate yield in, in any way. Um, but uh, we're you know based on the yield for the same size die that Apple etc. Uh, all get with their mobile devices uh, chips, we we expect to be in that range. The thing that The the worry the worry yeah yeah the the worry I have with that is we have a lot of memory compared so on that the 256 core chip that I'm saying here we would have 128 kilobytes of SRAM and uh, you know when 60 plus percent of our die area is, is SRAM we'd rather just you know throw out the the dies that you know have SRAM any SRAM failures and only keep the ones that you know pass pass these tests. And disks got a sudden jump in capacity when they decided memory can be wrong all the time. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess <laughs> I, 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 I like my stuff being correct. Erasure encoding, if every fetch is wrong, I mean, you're paying for the circuits anyway, so you might as well have them always active. It's definitely a thing we want to explore, but um, like there, there are ECC SRAMs with the 16 nanometer stuff. Like it's an option in the memory compiler to have, uh, um, you know, just single single bits correction and like two bits, uh, uh, you know, detection or I forget exactly. But uh, it, it's definitely a popular thing on newer designs. Something that we're we're willing to explore. But si since since we have so much SRAM. Adding anything like that is is going to be a big cost. Not adding it would be a bigger cost. Excuse me? Not adding it would be a bigger cost. <laughs> yeah. Well. Um, so so far, like when when we tested the memory on this test chip, it's surprising it all worked. And 64 kilobytes in in uh, you know 0.27 square millimeters for the whole. Uh, core size with the, the SRAM compared to the 0 0.1 for just the, the core and router logic. Um, you know, we were, we were surprised it, <laughs> that that worked. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, give you a bit of an idea in terms of uh, um, the, the total uh, area size for, for different cores. So just to compare those uh, on a 28 nanometer process, obviously TSMC and Global Foundries are a bit different, but it's a comparison. Um, we're getting significantly higher uh, flops 
per square millimeter. And like compared to a, a, an ARM Cortex A15 core that's 10x larger than our core, we're still, uh, you know, significantly uh, uh, higher performance. And then same thing with the full x86 uh, uh, core. Granted that um, uh, Jaguar was primarily a mobile device CPU, if I remember correctly, but uh, you know, I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> uh, same thing with Atom. But the, the big comparison here is Haswell, which is not only you know, a real Intel high performance core, but uh, one manufactured on a, a more advanced process now. It's a 22 nanometer. I love TSMC, but Intel's had the the, the, advan the fabrication advantage for a while, and uh, we're still, you know, little tiny core um, punching outside its weight class. We've got some great advisors, um, also not on here. I'd like to thank uh, Lenore Mullen um, and uh, Isaac Yonamoto, Yonamoto and uh, a bunch of others that have helped us a lot uh, along this whole process. And uh, we've uh, done a lot in a fairly small amount of time. So uh, just a couple pictures, which I forgot I had as hidden slides. So I'll go to show those. Very nice. <sighs> so that's my th uh, index finger that you see in the background there, out of focus. <laughs> we have ways of verifying if that's true or not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm turning off Touch ID on my iPhone now. <laughs> Um, so uh, that's you know our it's a three by four square millimeter full full die you know it has you can kind of make out the surdies on the north versus our core obviously the top metal layer uh, while you know it looks pretty under a light uh, it's uh, you know not uh, can't actually see that much in terms of details but you know we have a uh, 150 micron bumps uh, on the surdies and then higher uh, bump pitches. Uh, over the main cores and uh, 240 bumps total. It's not very complicated at all. Um, although we're looking at some really cool um, micro bump, bump technology around 30, 40 microns uh, with you know advancement advances on TSMC 16 nanometer. So very excited about that. Uh, made this using our uh, uh, GDS2 that we taped out with. Um, pretty design. I'm really crossing my fingers at some point. I'll you know, have a couple hours to, to uh, etch off uh, some of the upper layers to do another photo like the one before um, and uh, actually try to see some of the internal circuitry and such. But uh, yeah, that's pretty much that. Um, we could do a, a Neo SIM demonstration. We got it ready uh, for the FFT that was supposed to run on the real hardware. So you can now just see it running in, in simulation. <laughs> um, so, uh, Nerman, you want to come up? Cool. While he's setting up. Yeah. So, what is the memory latency on the load? So, load is one cycle. One cycle. And uh, remote transfer between cores? One cycle per hop. So, um, you know, going all the way so down log, and across. It's a log. It's a, yes. It's a log of mesh, or is it uh, just a mesh? A log or just mesh? Just mesh. Okay. So, uh, when we're going off chip, so th for the CERDES, uh, you know, 125 gigabit per second uh, bandwidth with the latency being four cycles from point to point. So when you go off of the um, router on, you know, die zero, appearing on die one, you're getting, that's an additional four cycles. And the memory accesses are perfectly uniform, no banking or anything like that? Um, there's, there's banking, but it's all aligned with, so all of our memory addresses are byte aligned and you can, yeah. No variation in no. strides or anything like that. No. Quick question. Is your mesh wrapped so that it come? No, it's not a torus. Uh, would love to do that. <laughs> but uh, uh, next time. Question. Yeah. Uh, one is you know, like parallel numerics. And uh, counter to that is like a sequential convolution. And uh, a good test for that is uh, entropy coding. For example, uh, Hoffman or arithmetic coding. Mm -hmm. Do you have some numbers on those? They also match, uh, map, uh, get, get a measure about, you know, uh, regular programs, but the most complex convoluted are the high entropy coding. So do you have a number, how many uh, clocks per bin coding? Um, I don't know specifically for, for that application. Um, so our compiler tools are still, in, like our main focus for the past two and a half, almost three months has just been getting our boards working. 
So we haven't been able to spend the time that we were originally planning on trying to get more software to run. Um, this FFT that Nariman's about to show is like the first quasi application demo that we've been able to muster and did have running on hardware, not, <laughs> and now not. <laughs> Presentation. Um, do you have a better answer for that? For the sequence, like, uh, sequential code. Yeah, I, I don't know. Branch intensive code. Like, like so, yeah, uh, this one, uh, this is an in place uh, FFTA algorithm that has three four loops in it, uh, a lot of iterations. Yeah, you can uh, start. Yeah. You can just start. Okay, yeah. Um, so yeah, we, we easy to use the branches basically. Um, I'm, a, I'm a hardware engineer myself, I'm not a software engineer here, but I use the assembly, wrote different codes for memory copy, uh, matrix multiplication, and the FFT, and it was just uh, very uh, basically efficient. We use the uh, branch LA slots and uh, we can parallelize, uh, parallelize basically instructions. I think the question is on, on serial code. Press out of the spec benchmarks. That's a particularly tough one for a VLIW. Um, you haven't looked at any of those? Not yet. Okay. Uh, case in point, Intel gave up on it already, and so did NVIDIA. <laughs> I know it because I was contracted to uh, design our alternate uh, architecture. So, um, but there, is, there are ways how you can map that sequential to end up recording into parallel architectures. Okay. Um, I'd like to talk to you more about that. Uh, I, I actually was on the HP team that transferred Itanium to Intel, and I coded decompress and got nearly six instructions per cycle. So you can do it, but it's hard work. <laughs> I got three bins per cycle. That's like a, uh, so uh, there are several IEEE things on that. But um, Intel's it, it is in the generation six Intel's process, but their main interest is different. So we can talk in that how you can utilize that approach. Yeah. Uh, so right now, in terms of what Naren's about to show with the simulator, you know, we're able to get cycle counts for things and such, but it's still a you know relatively you know very low level development environment for us. So we're hoping that we'll be able to get. To, um, Get more real applications running once we have the hardware in a more stable, <laughs> stable state. Uh, so, uh, I guess I, you know, I, I could talk through it. So, um, this is ICAS. Um, so, not very pretty at the moment, but uh, functional. Uh, so, we have basic scripting interface. He could technically load that script into the thing, but uh, create one of our tiles. Yeah, you can. Go through it. So yeah, first uh, we add. Uh, it depends how many uh, processor we want to, how many cores we want to run. For example, we have sixteen uh, cores. In here, we are just using one of them, and that is a uh, tile number zero. Uh, in the simulator, we add the tile first, and then we start initialize it uh, with the initial uh, code that we have. Like uh, we set the program counter to zero and uh, some other um, uh, like. Uh, operations like rounding, we set the rounding type and those kind of stuff for the protein point. Uh, after the reset, we this, with this command, we load the assembly code that I have written before. For example, this is an assembly code uh, for uh, FFT. It's not optimized at all, and uh, it's basically, it was written in two days ago, and not optimized at all, and basically, but... Uh, we also had a power outage <laughs> 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 for two and a half days. Basically. Uh, well, we work on this, on this more later, but this is uh, just for a demo that we can uh, show that we can do this FFT on our own core. And uh, so we have the FFT assembly, I have the three different factors for the FFT needed, and I have the inputs for the, the uh, FFT, which are 1,024 protein point double precision values. So, if we go to the script, uh, after the loading, uh, you. <laughs> okay. So, 
Yeah, uh, and after we load uh, the program into the uh, basically this simulation environment, we it takes um, for this one actually it takes about a hundred cycles to uh, load uh, more than more than hundred cycles, cycles. We load it into the memory to the uh, basically tile, and then after that we start the execution of the code. So what I can show you, I usually just copy and paste the whole thing. So basically what we do here. Um, it will, uh, by to this point, it will initialize the scratch pad or our memory. For example, um, I can show that I have loaded the x values into the bank number four, starting at address zero. I can show maximum for now. Um, okay, I, I can show it goes up to eight. I can show five of them. So you can see the x values in this uh, basically uh, memory addresses. These are the uh, double uh, point uh, IEEE format. Uh, and then, so now we can see the scratchpad memory values. So what I did uh, last night after running the FFT, I can compare the output values in the scratchpad with what we expect, and they were correct. So the FFT was working, but uh, uh, to see how the and so this this uh, basically uh, column shows the scratchpad values, which is our memory. This one we can see the register uh, file values and the our CSR registers, which are we use to program the core. And then these are the GRF and FRF, basically. General purpose register file and floating point register file. Right. So I can actually start. Uh, this is cycle accurate. If I say step ten, basically it will do. 10 uh, execution of 10 instructions and ten cycles. 10 cycles and then basically whatever changes the simulator uh, basically shows it in a different color and this one this plus one increments the by one cycle basically and uh, well this FFT takes uh, a few hundred thousand cycles for example, if I do 100,000 step, it takes a little bit of time. And do you have then, the NeoSim console open? Oh, uh, yeah, it's on the back. This one? Um, yeah. So this is... Uh, it's going in the wrong direction. Okay, so for exa example, we did... Uh, what, 100,000 steps, and uh, so it was running at 377 kilohertz. Uh, still, that's, you know, 10x faster than, uh, um, is this, this is running on Intel Xeon, you know, 2 gigahertz compared to the 4 gigahertz uh, that I mentioned before, but still much faster than regular RTL simulation, but still fully cycle accurate. Um, I guess one other thing I want to point out that this uh, console that's being showed here is the server for the uh, actual simulator. So this... Um, iCast GUI is able to connect to a external server. Um, in this case, it's just running on the same machine. But one of the things that we uh, want to enable is have uh, um, simulator instances running up on you know an external server that has a bunch of cores relatively fast, but uh, be able to have the actual client um, running on any sort of device. So you have a very uh, um, you know can have development tools running anywhere. So continue. So um, I can just jump to the basically end of the simulation. Um, maybe I go 200,000 more cycles. And um, it's going to finish soon. OK. Yeah, so when I add uh, any cycle, so we don't see any change in the GRF and FRF values, meaning the execution is done, and then at the end we have a for loop, just stay, just to keep the count, uh, uh, programming counter at, uh, basically not going to the beginning of the program. And uh, when it's done, we can uh, see the final values in the scratch pad, and that's how I compare the values with the expected values, and they're correct. And we have added uh, a few functions just uh, in, the, in the last uh, two days, we don't have to see the values in hex. Now we can show the, uh, the values in decimal, and uh, basically it will be easier to interpret them. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Thanks. 
So um, that's the the basics of the iCast tool. There's you know our assembler and so like the assembly file you saw there. Um, the the actual machine code obviously that's being generated by LVM um, currently with just a very basic set of optimization passes, um, but uh, the the actually taking from C code. Um, Probably take me a couple minutes to find it, but uh, we do have. So there's no op, there's no ops. That's the ad latency that you're waiting for the result. Yeah, so this is really just not not optimized at all. But yeah, since it's pipelined, we're just waiting for for that. The there's a couple of examples in here where you're having multiple instructions on a single line. But like for example, the all all of these uh, like this oh here. So this has two instructions together, but um, I'm, there's multiple cases here, like with ads, like these, this ad could have been done up in another spot, but yeah. So, so integer ad is four cycles, is that what I'm seeing there? Um, so yeah, four to get, to get, cycles. correct, so to get through the full pipeline to what's back in the, the register, but you can issue a new one yeah, every cycle. Yeah. The only things that are not pipeline are the, the integer divide. That's, you have to wait 60, 67 cycles for, but uh, uh, three. So, so the integer divide is 67, but our floating point is only 20, 20, 26. But, but you can issue a new floating point divide every 14, huh? 12, okay. <laughs> Or it's just I couldn't hear you. Uh, are you using SRT divides, or is it just uh, subtracts and shifts? Um, for divide. So the so the addition, or so, so the ALU divide is is what are you calling like grade school it's division it's log division. Yeah. The floating point unit. Actually, do we ever figure out what they use? So the the flo the floating point unit is Berkeley hard flow. So yeah, one. Of Oh, one thing. So, I think they use. No, 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 they use Goldschmidt, or do they use Newton? It's no, you're only Goldschmidt. It's not self correct it, it is Newton. It's Newton and uh, correctly rounded. Um, I believe you were the one that verified. <laughs> it verified against whatever. I got patents. I got patents on division. And so <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the expert on this. Maybe we'll so, talk so after. So yeah, <laughs> Goldschmidt. You can. You can. If you do a floating point Goldschmidt, you can check at the end and figure out. <coughs> Goldschmidt isn't self-correcting, so you have, have to, to use full precision yeah. all the time. Could you, you see a way to see the uh, information like in the pipeline? Yeah. Um, so that's schematic view, which is not working at the moment. <laughs> so. Too. You if we didn't have the power outage, we would have. <laughs> so just to, to calculate something like A plus B plus C, if I'm understanding correctly, that's four or five cycles because you can't use the output of the a, first A plus B until four cycles later? Uh, yes. Correct. So I I think there's an... So the, just for for integer addition, correct? I'm just talking about addition. Oh, yeah, yeah, integer addition. Yes. So, uh, so a mixed test could be a very common one in video cortex. Is eight by eight two uh, D transform cosine? It doesn't have the sine part. It's just the cosine. Um, how many clocks would that be? There. It's a eight point two uh, D eight by eight transform DC cosine transform. Uh, we haven't run cosine yet. Yeah, I mean, this, uh, this is all questions for Paul, who yeah. thought it was better to be programming than to come to a, a talk. <laughs> I see because you know th those numbers like to another mentioned. Six clocks per bit decode, you know, number, or the one I'm proposing, uh, I have a solution. Three bins per clock, which is like the uh, order is faster. And then is the cosine transform, which is, these are very practical used ones. So a comparison you have to compare against is like 12 clocks for one eight by eight two D transform. So if you can beat that, then you're better than Intel. Otherwise, it's a uh, you know, confusion a little bit. Well, I'd like to sit down and talk a bit more. I think I could show you some of our um, ISI documentation that would probably answer that question better. They actually use the uh, cosine transform because it has fewer uh, floating point multiplies at the expense of additional integer multiplies. And it was designed at a time when the ratio of those two operations was different. 
And I've argued they should just be using a full FFT in a rule, on a machine that optimized for floating point and one faster. But they still use the cosine transform. In the yeah, I was one of the persons who decided on going the cosine way. And it was the right decision when it was made. It's <laughs> yes. not the right decision now. Uh, uh, and now it has gone to integer transform. Right. So it stays uh, integers. And the decision will move on the other. Just to be, to be clear, some of these algorithms, you're not running them on a single core, you're running them on 64 cores. Right. Yes. Tremendous parallelism compared to a you know, four core. I, yeah. And I guess, compare, like, one of the things that we have to also look at is just what sort of instruction bundles we can actually put together for, for some of these things. So, so the, the that you were going to demonstrate, but then that was actually using the spread across all four cores? Yeah, 16. And, yeah, but yes. Uh, this one was just on one. Hmm? This one was just on one. The, 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 the simulator was on one. The one that actually hardware was, yeah. yeah. That, that's the one you're kind of benchmarking against. Yeah, that's fair. John? Uh, could you talk a little bit about your business model or your, your plans, how you plan to introduce this to the world? Are you going to become a chip vendor or a board level product vendor or a system level product vendor or an IP licensor or what do you expect to do? Cloud service. <laughs> uh, anything but Bitcoin. But um, uh, yeah, uh, so we're mainly looking at being an actual just fabulous semi, uh, you know, chip vendor. Uh, the the whole the main goal in having this development board is. Uh, Part proof of concept, part being able to, you know, with the FPGA, we can hook up this to either a PC and kind of have a coprocessor sort of demonstration, or even better, uh, have it connected to a radio antenna stack. And with that, we can have uh, one FPGA on this side that, uh, you know, can be running a soft core or something, running Linux, and uh, you've got 100 gigabit Ethernet in, do a whole bunch of stuff, uh, sending data over to our. Uh, say having four of our chips, so 64 cores total going across here, and then another FPGA on this side that has the actual like LTE radio antennas, and we could be doing full digital um, uh, software-defined radio on our chip, um, significantly lower power than than anything else out there. So like this 10, 24 point FFT, you know, not optimized and missing a lot of pieces, but uh, um, in terms of the, the gigaflops number for that. The efficiency for that is very comparable to wanting to do a, an LTE stack. Um, so we're, you know, be beating the ASICs and DSPs doing that right now with a, you know, fairly hacked together chip. So the, the business model is that perhaps someday I'll be able to send you a purchase order and you'll send me back a box of packaged discrete chips that I saw here in my board. Uh, yes, so mostly it would be for you know OEMs. So we want to be working with the Ericsson's, Nokia's, et cetera, of the world for putting these into uh, uh, the, the boxes for that. What is the current state of the chip architecture documentation, the instruction set, the uh, instruction encoding, that sort of stuff? So if we can switch to the other computer, I God, I wanted to show that. So we have both a web-based and uh, um, PDF version of the ISA documentation. So the goal is to try to get this out next month. Um, we want to be able to publish this on the website and shortly after have uh, um, some version of the simulator tools available. But uh, it's uh, currently partially auto-generated and we're throwing in a bunch of uh, documentation with that to you know, actually inform on the, the precepts of the architecture, but the, the main goal is we want to have C support to go along with this sort of release. So there are plenty of people that are going to want to look at the, uh, the ISA and the actual assembly, toy around with that a bit, and we want to give the tools like, the, with, like ICAST to be able to, so you can really make optimized great uh, uh, assembly, but uh, um, for most people you're going to want to write in C or some other LLVM front-end language. Intelligible to others. Are, are there non disclosure issues? Will that be thrown into the public domain? No, so not, not public domain, but that'll be available to anyone that's interested. It's not going to be public domain or open source, so we do have uh, some patents related to the particulars of our instruction set. I was using 
but the wrong term. I'm just saying not under on the NDA. Yeah, we, we want to give as much documentation just out to the public. Um, obviously, we're, we're keeping rights, you know, when it comes to actually producing chips with the instruction set, et cetera. But in terms of all the CSRs, exactly, you know, how you can tweak and do everything possible, we want to be as open as, as we can. So if there's no floating point operations, um, those slots are just left empty, or can you put integer in them? Um, so here's taking a look at the ISA a bit. Um, so, uh, so you're saying for this whole slot here? Yeah, it's just, I'm just doing purely integer computation. So those would all just be zeros. Um, in the future, we've been thinking about some ways to be able to to refurbish some of that. One of the surprises on the Intel um, was more interested in scalar code than than high performance computing. And so they insisted that they have different instruction formats, both with floating point and they added ex additional integer functional units so that they could keep the slots busy. Um, and that was one of the, the changes that came from the HP version to the Intel version. Yeah, one of the things I'm going to be working is refactoring this, uh, this spreadsheet sort of thing um, to be a bit more readable, usable. But like there are some really powerful things you could do to really optimize. Like if you want to do a fuse multiply add up here, and uh, you need to have this third operand register, but you also want to be doing a uh, um, you know post modify uh, 128 bit double word and do that on on both units, etc. Well, it may look like oh these overlap. Lap. You have you can't use this instruction. This instruction. In reality, you could just have the same register number. This is using floating point register. That may be using a different one, etc. But so you might be able to dual purpose the floating point function unit to do integer ops. Yeah, so that, that won't be able to be done with this yeah. silicon, but uh, in the future, yeah. There, there's a lot to, to be uh, uh, learned in terms of exactly what packets of instructions using the full 64 bits to its maximal, uh, maximum potential. Um, but the, the, basic, the basics of the, the architecture, the ISA, et cetera, like, all of our instructions fit on you know a single page. You can look at this, print it out, and you know get a good idea. And uh, in terms of the full ISA documentation, I think you can get a very good idea in a couple hours to uh, you know maybe an afternoon of uh, looking at uh, our documentation in about a month. Uh, full disclosure: I've had the occasion to chat with you several times through the last couple of years. And I don't claim to understand the, your architecture issues, but I've been surprised at how well you seem to understand a lot of different architectures from a lot of different vendors <laughs> going back decades. And, <laughs> and I've got a 40-year head start on you, and you know a lot of this, these products better than I do. So I, I'm wondering what got you interested in this field of architecture, how long you've been trying to study all of these competing products, what you know, what, how you manage to learn things from them, just how intimately familiar are you with using all of these things that you've alluded to? You had uh, Itanium and x86 and some other architectures up there. I've used most things that uh, um, have existed, like most common things that have existed in the past 20 years or so, so my lifetime. I guess alpha and, and after, but uh, um, like a lot of the floating point system designs, multi-flow, et cetera, et cetera, that I, we've taken a lot of architectural inspiration from um, uh, CDC, everything back to the CDC 6600. Um, I'm a huge fan of and you know love, but um, sadly I've not gotten the chance to use them. And in terms of emulators and such, I like if I had free time or something, that's something that I would love to do because of, uh, uh, but in terms of actually being able to create those emulators, since I haven't looked deeply, but um, they don't, the few that I've seen don't seem to be that great. But um, in, in a general sense, just to say how I got interested in all this, um, I started getting more interested in deeper uh, aspects of you know, computer science when I was about 13, and I just always had to know why something, like not just the how, how something works, but why that developed, you know, the whole, reason Rex exists and we went in this direction was not just ex the fact that I could not just accept that the way something is done is the only way it, it can be done and that it is necessarily the right way. So. That's for sure. 
I uh, haven't seen anything about any kind of privileged mode or the kinds of things that float around in uh, <laughs> most of the uh, big CPUs that are floating around these days. Yeah. So uh, the, uh, go, go, uh, go ahead. I think okay, you're going to answer my question. Okay. Um, so there is no privileged mode or anything. We are looking at having a bit of uh, memory protection options, but at a very, it's more like address um, protection, mm -hmm. like ranging at the network on chip level in the future. There's a lot of things uh, that we can do in terms of being able to, um, uh, say, restrict access to certain portions of the network and give a lot of these, uh, mm -hmm. you know, not just the level of hard real-time guarantees for latency, but saying there's no way, no chance at all that, you know, stuff can get passed around certain things. So that's not in this silicon, but uh, we've already been toying around with things for the future. There are applications where it's not needed. Um, between uh, using a VLIW instruction set and branch pad memory and branch delay slots, it seems like you've got a really big compiler problem on your hands. Yeah. And 30 plus years of VLIW experience has come up with much better superscalar compilers. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the thing that's just never actually been done, and or at the very least done well, um, is the fact that there's not been an architecture that gives memory guarantees at, at the level that we do. And the problem I've just looked at time and time again is that if you cannot say, be it because of some particular area of the network on chip or because of uh, um, you know where you are in the pipeline, what instructions you executed, whatever, if you can't say when you can use data or where it will be somewhere else to be used, there's no way a compiler can, can actually figure things out. Um, and it, yeah, I, in, in our case, um, we're able to leverage a lot of the basic stuff just from the open source community. There's been tens, hundreds, millions of dollars invested into LLVM and the things surrounding it by Google, Facebook, Apple, et cetera. Um, and uh, we've been able to leverage a lot of that up to now um, to just get basic support working. And the, the you know, relatively simple optimization passes. The future parts are actually going, you know, are difficult in terms of being able to, to, to do this. That, that there's, you know, we don't have a... So you can utilize our scratch pads like a cache in terms, like, in, in a similar way. It's without just not... Without history, without, 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 <laughs> without the, the functionality of automatic, like, the hardware trying to make a guess. Yeah. Um, but in that sense, we're also never going to have a cashiness. It doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> like, not, not having a hit, but you're not having this. So. I, I think you're going to end up with something that's really fast on, on, on certain benchmarks, and it's going to be painful on general purpose. Um, well, we're not running Windows on it. That's okay. that's yeah. one of the things. But. Not running Windows, and uh, I think for most of the applications we're looking at, you know, the ones that we've already made small demos for are things, DSP-like tasks, which have been the, the things that have continued to be VLIW through. The, the scary thing for me a little bit has been TI is now trending to actually using real hardware managed caches, and their efficiency numbers have actually gone down with the past, uh, with the newest generation versus older ones. But... We're getting this wrong, but I, my understanding is that is that basically the huge thing is is the determinism, right? You know when something is going to happen, and effectively this is a um, this is, this optimization problem has fairly you know good solutions in, in good like you know algorithms to find a reasonable solution, even if it's not necessarily the most optimal. The hard part is the if test where the latencies on the two branches are different because you don't know at run at compile time which branch you're going to take. Or, or you can turn the sure. branch backwards. You can say, okay, given any length of code, what is the most complex can it get? And the answer is there in nature already. It is in video coding, the images. They already, when you're trying to compress that, you know, that's what you're looking for, how much you could build on the previous thing. So if you build a lecture backwards to deal with entropy coding, then you can solve that video high speed video coding problem and you can throw windows in there easily. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
this question that kind of relates to both of your points about um, the architecture, architecture maybe not being suited for certain tasks, specifically things that are very serial and not, you know, trivially parallel. Can you speak a little bit to, because um, the architecture that you guys have described is, is Mindy and, and not Cindy. Can you speak a little bit to the advantages if we're going to kind of compare this to, let's say, an NVIDIA GPU where you have Cindy and, and yours? And maybe, for example, for uh, yeah. I know the advantage that you get, um, let's say, for pipelining neural networks. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so. The, the real point of when you have a MIMD architecture is just that you can uh, exploit task level parallelism that GPUs simply cannot do. Um, or, you know, NVIDIA GPUs with the, S, you know, the, the current CUDA core and SMIX unit, et cetera, architecture. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's a much longer question than the t minute that I've got left. <laughs> um, so, at a very high... <laughs> Okay, at a very high level, I uh, would say that the, the biggest thing is just that compared to you know, SIMD, SIMD architecture where you have 192 CUDA cores for each unit that uh, are all restricted to doing the exact same instruction simultaneously, each one of our cores have four execution units, all that can be doing simultaneous work, and then we have n number of cores on a chip that can all be doing completely independent tasks. Um, the pipelining aspect, either, you know, in the case with our test chip, where we have two CERTES, or in the future having multiple CERTES uh, on all, covering all of the corners, you could do cool data flow or systolic array type things where you have big input data streams coming on one side and you're pushing across. Or uh, you know, there's plenty of different models which you could take either having a group cluster of cores um, operating and passing data together. Um, you know, where they actually are using you know the the problem size that you actually have the the data. Isn't uh, is too large for a single core scratch pad? You figure that it's actually worth taking the latency penalty to you know having to move and you know either square or a, a row of uh, of, uh, uh, of 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 scratch of uh, excuse me cores. And so uh, yeah, that's very application dependent. Specifically on machine learning, that you said um, you <laughs> I've had a lot of people say that is your architecture uh, neural inspired or something. And I would say no to that, but uh, the way that you know you do convolutional neural networks with you know big giant matrix dense matrices and do matrix multiplication like that, yeah, you can do that on our architecture. Um, I would say it's almost certain it, it's certainly more efficient than what you're going to get with a uh, NVIDIA GPU, um, but uh, performance-wise, a SIMD architecture can do really dense uh, large matrices pretty darn fast. Basically, it's similar. Access basic. Main issue is just the back propagation. So it's like a backwards FFT where you're sending all those propagations. I, I would say the training aspect, GPUs would have, you know, the performance advantage, the kind of like, um, uh, the, excuse me for the word, the, the actual um, running of an, a trained neural net afterwards. Um, would be something that I think we would be able to do very well because you know you can have a group of cores dedicated to that while uh, um, you know other cores could be running different parts of your uh, overall application since that probably isn't the only thing that you want your chip to do. And that's just something a GPU wouldn't be able to do. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I think you already have uh, some of the answer there. Basically, FFT is a full butterfly. Yeah. And neural nets can be, you don't have to do a full butterfly, you can have it just a small, you know, levels of how you're switching backwards for back propagation. You know, not every node has to propagate in every previous state in node. So you already have a neural net solution in your architecture. Yeah, yeah I, there is, I guess, I'm skeptical, well, I would love to be proven wrong and have my architecture be better, but. Uh, <laughs> I, I am holding out until we have real benchmark data. And I was really hoping we would have a couple more demos than just uh, this one that I swear was running on hardware uh, <laughs> but, but four hours ago. So assuming that you are very, very fast with FFT, yeah. right? I mean, you know, given the convolution theorem I, I've, and everything, and A, the convolution theorem, right, where you can just do multiplication after, you know, in the, in the, in the frequency domain, but uh, B, 
uh, more specifically that uh, backpropagation specifically can be rephrased as a convolution over the uh, you know the uh, the out the, uh, uh, the output from the previous layer with like your with the flipped um, kernel. So you, you can rephrase back propagation as just kind of the same kind of convolution. Theoretically, you should, if you're going to be as fast and as efficient for FFT, uh, I can't see it, uh, you know, unless I'm missing something with, with the memory uh, aspect there. It seems like you should be also very, very fast for uh, at least convolutional. Neural oh, I, I definitely think we'll be fast. I guess, like, our advantage compared to, compared to a GPU, a GPU can't do an FFT like we're, we're doing. It like our 16 core thing here, you know, little tiny chip will outdo a lot of NVIDIA's GPUs um, on just that raw level like that. I would love to actually have a benchmark to show that we can beat out, you know, a GPU on. on the reason I asked about the memory subsystem was two dimensional FFT. realization and uh, um, said that you know we need to architect a new uh, architecture you know with this fact in mind so uh, we've developed the neo processor architecture um, so it's a 200 so it's a many core MIMD uh, core um, VLIW I'll get to that back to that in a second. Hopefully people don't get too scared about the VLIW word um, with the fancy two-dimensional uh, um, network on chip and uh, a very, uh, the, the big differentiator, what I just spent the past couple minutes talking about is uh, really the uh, on-chip cache hierarchy differences. So we've moved to a purely software managed memory system where we have just plain physically addressed um, local memories for each one of our, our cores um, and then do all of the fancy uh, things that are handled by today's hardware managed memory systems uh, instead in software. And the, the real goal of this, you know, set off that, uh, you know, unless we can really get an order of magnitude energy efficiency improvements, uh, there's no real point in, in doing what we're trying to do. Um, you know, we're up against enough competition, you know, four guys versus uh, uh, Intel. And, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, we have to have a, a, you know, real sort of advantage for that. Um, so as I said before, you know, we've designed a lot of uh, aspects of this. Uh, so everything from the instruction set to the full chip. But uh, we realize that, you know, we can't just, even though I'm in love with the hardware aspects, uh, you actually need to have software run on this thing and, you know, have this available to folks in a way that they can actually use. And so, uh, you know, not just defining the instruction set core chip, but also the actual reference node designs and the software tools to be able to use this. Uh, so as Andy said a bit earlier about uh, uh, the original S1 team and developing all of the tools necessary for that computer, um, uh, you know, we've taken a, a fairly similar approach. I guess we've been able to leverage the past 30 years of advancement and knowledge in that sense, plus uh, the advent of, uh, you know, the real development of the open source software community. But, uh, you know, starting to do all this for, for ourselves uh, is quite a big leap. So, uh, kind of give you a little bit of idea of the instruction set. I guess this slide is maybe a bit out of order from what I originally wanted, but uh, you know, it's a very risk inspired architecture. I did say the VLIW word uh, a bit earlier, which a few shocked expressions on people's faces. Yeah, so I was asked to here to talk about Rex computing. Um, as Andy was saying, we've developed a, a new process architecture, so uh, a whole new instruction sets, core design, uh, full chip implementing those cores, and uh, uh, with a team of four people, which uh, you can see here. So myself, uh, Paul in the Georgia Tech shirt, uh, sorry for being here at Stanford. Uh, at least it's not like MIT, I am. But, um, and then Nariman, who's also in the audience, and Piyush. And uh, without all of them, obviously, I would not be here today. Um, a little over three years ago, this just started off as a crazy idea. And uh, coupled with, you know, being a bit young and the naivety of both uh, Paul and I, we actually thought we can make a processor uh, for, you know, basically no money and, uh, uh, you know, the two of us. Had to double the team size, but uh, I think we've done uh, pretty well so far. So um, when we started Rex, we uh, were trying to think about, um, uh, you know, 
what are the basic precepts of, of uh, computer architecture that haven't really been rethought over the past 30 or 40 years. And uh, as we're digging deeper into, you know, what are the really bare minimum things necessary to do computation, um, we started thinking that it's not as much of the computation itself that is the issue, but how we actually get data to uh, the processor and uh, really the whole memory system. And while there has been a lot of talk about the memory system at a, uh, uh, you know, more focus on the memory itself, so trying to find alternatives to DRAM, et cetera, um, there hasn't been much thought in terms of, uh, you know, how it's actually architected on the chip itself. Your slide says confidential. I will have to leave the room if that's true. <laughs> Excuse me, I've taken a bunch of these slides from other decks, and uh, all of this is not confidential. <laughs> Screen six inches. <laughs> 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 um, Does that still have 2016 on it? Yeah. Uh, you can tell how uh, we've been busy actually working on the chip instead of the, the slide decks. That's a good thing. <laughs> it means you didn't finish the whole thing this afternoon. <laughs> um, yeah, so. Uh, Basically, what we were looking at in terms of the memory system was, um, but uh, uh, our real point here is to uh, keep a very simple, very clean design and you know, try to exploit as much instruction level parallelism, task level parallelism, and uh, you know, actual data parallelism as possible. Um, everything's load store based, so our memory actually moving data around on chip through multiple chips and using off chip memories uh, is a, a, a very simple clean design, and uh, we've really focused on floating point uh, performance. Um, so everyone's scared about uh, VLIW, and this is the thing I get all the time with the number one thing being Itanium. Um, so wasn't it proven that you know I, uh, uh, VLIW just doesn't work with Itanium? And I bring up this uh, picture of a uh, uh, you know, block diagram of the Itanium architecture, and a uh, big problem the, the original concept of, of VLIW, which you know, was really pioneered by floating point systems and you know, the actual VLIW name with uh, um, multi-flow and um, others in the mid-late 80s, uh, was this concept that you can remove a lot of complexity out of the chip design itself um, in order to and you know, have a software be able to take some of that burden off. And most of that back then was related to the instruction decoder. So instead of having these really complex CISC uh, arc, uh, instructions um, that, you know, you had a big fancy decoder that handled all the scheduling, making sure that, you know, you're not um, uh, having any instructions conflict, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it was the compiler's job to actually do all of that for, for the hardware. And so when I look at Itanium with branch prediction, these caches, which are indeterminate, uh, indeterminate pipelines, depending on what instructions you're running, um, in what order, et cetera, et cetera, where you just cannot actually know how the processor will perform at runtime um, what, when you're compiling an application, how is the compiler actually able to do this uh, and actually make any of these sort of optimizations? So uh, the big part, which I'll get to in a bit with uh, Rex, is, oops, um, is uh, this fact that we are really focused on hard real-time determinism for everything. And then the second thing I always get is for scratch pads. So this concept of a software managed memory system where uh, we have, you know, just physical addressing, uh, you know, none of the, the fancy caching, et cetera, for uh, uh, the actual end user um, always brings up comparisons to sell. So if you're familiar with the cell processor made as a collaboration between uh, Toshiba, Sony, and IBM, uh, primarily you know, used in the uh, um, uh, PlayStation 3, uh, it was notoriously difficult to program with because the, the real idea by Sony and Toshiba at that point was uh, to use what the, were the cell special processing units, the SPUs, or SPEs, and the, uh, and the whole design point of this was they were you know, relatively powerful but still small. They had eight of these in you know, a 2005 processor, um, but, IBM's part of the agreement was that they were going to be fabricating the chip, but also uh, they want to actually have you know, more skin in the game and put in that uh, uh, power processing unit, so power PC architecture. And uh, the big problem with this was that created a huge bottleneck where in the SP, with the SPUs, the uh, um, 
actual only way that you could get to external memory was actually having to go through the power processing unit. So there was this huge overhead, and that system had its own cache, et cetera, that just made it impossible for um, you know, a compiler to actually know how to, to access large parts memory, and just real pain in the ass. So um, when we're going into the Neo architecture a bit, uh, I like using this as and give an idea of the instruction set. Uh, so here we have up in the upper left hand corner, the floating point unit and its uh, instructions. So we've got um, uh, you know, 22 instructions total for the floating point units that uh, uh, supports full IEEE 64 bit um, in the future doing packed uh, single precision, potentially half, and other formats. Um, and uh, the real, you know, philosophy behind VLIW is being able to exploit task level or instruction level parallelism. So we want to be able to use the FPU, the load store unit, the outbox or secondary load, load store unit, and the ALU all at once. So one of the really unique things that we did with our instruction set architecture was this fact that we can... Uh, if you look at this full 64-bit word, we're fitting four different instructions from four different units in it. And depending on the actual uh, register usage of uh, the different instructions, the length of the, the way that the entire 64 bits is allocated tells you exactly the on-chip cache hierarchy. And over the decades, this has grown from having an off-chip uh, SRAM back cache, uh, very small, still relatively uh, high latency compared to the actual chip uh, speed, but uh, you know, still faster, closer access than uh, uh, DRAM. And you know, since uh, uh, the um, you know, 286, we've gone to having uh, on-chip caches, L1, L2, L3, et cetera, um, without much thought of the, the implications that that has as we start to approach the, you know, twilight phase of Moore's Law. Um, and so while, uh, you know, 30 years ago, if you were looking at this diagram then compared to now, which this is for uh, Intel Sandy Bridge architecture, um, while doing the actual floating, double precision floating point operation only takes about 100 picojoules, actually moving the 64 bits necessary all the way from DRAM to your register file takes about 40x more energy than that. And uh, uh, that's kind of a problem. And while there's been, you know, all of the, the free benefits of Moore's Law has been really helping that what is now 100 picojoules hasn't really helped much on the other side. Um, so when most people think, uh, look at this slide and say, uh, uh, oh, well, that makes sense. The DRAM is, you know, separate on the motherboard. You have to, you know, that is having to be refreshed. It's using a good amount of power itself. You know, that, that's fine. But in reality, about 60% of that 4,200 picojoules is being used on the processor itself. So, you know, the, the DRAM and everything, even if that uh, gets closer to your processor, like we're trying to do 3D integration within packages, and even if we're trying all these new fancy, uh, um, you know, memory technologies outside the chip, um, that's only improving 40% of that number. Uh, and the main thing that's just happened over these decades is this uh, uh, more and more, uh, adding more and more complexity to the on-chip cache hierarchy in order to try to help programmers is the, the main, main point. Um, you know, programmers don't want to manage memory, like the initial purpose of caches, just so the programmer can, you know, just deal with the virtual address space, don't have to, you know, segment that themselves, really just make their lives easier. And uh, this idea is, is great in theory, but uh, um, the cost that we're starting to pay, especially as uh, we're not getting the f you know free improvements that we have in the past, um, is really starting to bite us. So uh, we started Rex with this 